afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the second in our series of activities for Learning Health System Month. Uh, my name is Allison Hall. I'm a co-director of the Corps, and I'm very excited today to highlight some of the work that's happening within our own as institution around learning health systems. So to do that, I'm going to uh, introduce you to Dr. Kelly Flood. Uh, Dr. Flood is a member of our Learning Health Systems Task Force. She has been very helpful and influential in helping us think about what learning health systems might look like here at UAB. Uh, many of you know her. She's a geriatrician. She uh, does a lot of work in palliative care, but most importantly and relevant to the topic at hand is that she's been involved in our accountable care team. So Dr. Flood, take it away. Thank you so much, Dr. Hall. I'm gonna share my screen. I uh, really appreciate, uh, can you all see my PowerPoint slides? We see your like notes. You need to sort of put it on. Yeah, you need to put it on. Is that better? You need to hit the uh, little uh, button at the bottom that is um, presentation, but uh, yes, perfect. All right, excellent. Thank you so much. See, I'm learning in Learning Health System Month. So uh, appreciate everyone's sharing your valuable time with us today. We're super excited for you all to hear from our accountable care team panel, uh, but recognizing that you know, both the topic of learning health systems and or accountable care teams may be relatively new to some, if not most or all on the call. Um, we wanted to provide just a little bit of background information to provide some context. So when you do hear from our panel and they'll fill in some of the details, it'll, it'll make more sense. So first of all, to kick us off, what is a learning health system? Well, Many, many years ago, healthcare began this uh, transformational shift from a volume to a value-based system. That is the overall goal is to deliver the best quality care in a way that's efficient and effective. And even more importantly, in our current post-COVID world, we need to deliver this care in a way that eliminates waste and reduced overall costs, especially in our current staffing constraints. So over a decade ago, the Institute of Medicine described the learning health system framework as the primary pathway to achieve this higher quality care in an efficient and effective way. And so think of a learning health system as a system that is intentionally um, developed structure and processes to always be learning, always be in this cycle of learning of how to better provide care or, or better practice medicine. So this learning includes the incorporation of external data or knowledge from research around evidence-based practices, internal data that comes from internal quality improvement efforts. These internal and external learnings become now new evidence that drives practice change at the system level that then generates new learnings or data that's shared internally and externally. And you see you have this constant cycle of learning in an efficient way so that care delivery is improved in a way that not only are outcomes better, but the workplace, the system works better for those working at the front lines of care delivery. So why is it important that we at UAB become a learning health system? Well, think of this as, as another means of de-siloing ourselves, right? So if we continue to break down silos through intentional learning health system structures, connectors that are put in place, now our clinical care and clinical operations is better connected to our quality improvement efforts and our research efforts. So we can have a collective sharing of our, of our vast expertise and our resources. And again, we just become more efficient and effective in driving system-based change. So with that in mind, what is an accountable care team? Well, an accountable care team brings the learning health system structures and processes to the microsystem level. So in a hospital setting, think of a microsystem as an individual hospital unit or a hospital service, such as our renal transplant service, who you'll hear from today. What's the goal of the microsystem? It's to deliver care that is quality, defined as care that's safe, timely, effective, efficient, equitable, and patient-centered in a way that the microsystem works better for those working in that system. So it's a positive experience. It's easier to deliver quality care. And so how does an accountable care team structure support this at the unit level? 
Well, for each individual microsystem, we first identified what we term this leadership triad. So it's a physician leader, a nurse leader, which is the nurse manager of a unit, and then an operations leader or support um, structure folks who help provide just that administrative support, gathering data, coordinating activities, making connections. So that administrative support to this local leadership triad. This leadership triad then enters formal leadership and team development training from our leadership development office. And then a broader locally based interprofessional team that includes the leadership triad plus designated folks from care transitions, our acute therapies, uh, and our pharmacy and others, as it indicates, these folks all go through formal discipline problem solving training through our Department of Clinical Practice Transformation. And you'll see representatives from these two departments on our panel. So now that this locally based interprofessional team that is now equipped and empowered to lead disciplined problem solving, they have access to their data through the Accountable Care Team dashboard that helps them identify system level problems to solve at their microsystem level. We'll show you some real life examples, all designed to incorporate the voice of the patient to design our care and our workflows around a patient population and to celebrate uh, each other along the way and really create this, this culture of teamness. So these uh, accountable care teams, here's a photo of a Zoom meeting of one of these weekly problem solving uh, meetings for our renal transplant accountable care team. So you see all the different disciplines that come together every single week for this discipline problem solving for the renal transplant service and included on this team is acute therapy. Um, apologies, we're missing them from this photo, but therapies are rep uh, represented on these teams as well. So this is now a learning community that is entered uh, and trained in discipline problem solving. So data is used to identify a problem to work on related usually to care quality or care efficiency, external uh, information around best practices or benchmarks and internal or data are used to drive plan, do, study, act, discipline, problem solving cycles that generate new information for this continued cycle of learning and problem solving, all designed around bringing value-based care. So improved outcomes, improved care efficiency to support the care teams, the organization, and the patients. So our renal transplant team, you'll meet them today. You'll meet Dr. Mehta and Raquel uh, from the triad leadership team. The first problem they worked on was the length of stay in their renal transplant patients. So they knew from external data, the blue line is actual length of stay. The, the orange line is case mix index adjusted length of stay, they knew that we here at UAB had opportunities because our length of stay was longer than what benchmarks suggest they could be. This renal transplant accountable care team underwent their formal leadership training, their problem solving training. Length of stay was the first initiative they chose to work on. They are now functionally independently and you see this ongoing downward trend and improvement because they have redesigned their microsystem to deliver coordinated, efficient care. Our early accountable care teams came mostly from, uh, in addition to renal transplant, came from our hospitalist unit. So imagine this is one of about six hospital medicine accountable care teams. These teams all chose to work on DPART efficiency. So the percent of discharge patients who leave the hospital by 1 p.m. This is a critical quality metric for not only patients getting to leave the hospital, but for all the patients boarding in our ED who need to move up into the beds on those units. And what's very telling about their accomplishment in redesigning their system is you see this dramatic improvement in percentage of patients leaving by 1 p.m., but this change was sustained all throughout COVID, even when it was our hospitalist units that were taking care of COVID patients. So this is proof that they really redesigned the system. It's not these folks having to do more or think differently on, on these days to drive DPART efficiency. This just becomes standard operating procedure. Now, to make that connection in a learning health system, when we connect this work of frontline clinicians with health services and outcomes researchers, such as Dr. Hall and her team, this work now becomes a scholarly publication to further inform the external community. Another example, when you embed uh, Dr. Catherine Meese, who you'll meet on our panel, who studies wellness and well-being in the healthcare setting amongst healthcare workers, 
Now she can evaluate the impact that participating on an accountable care team can have on staff well-being. So through cross-sectional survey data, she was able to compare these drivers of well-being and reducing distress in accountable care team members versus those who are not yet participating. And you see significantly higher scores from our accountable care team triad participants feeling they had more decisional involvement, they had ac better access to improvement opportunities, to innovation, they had an overall better feeling of teamness in their microsystems. This too is now a recently accepted publication. And even more importantly, this data was used to secure a 2.3 million HRSA grant to study and support nursing well being here at UAB Hospital. So, this learning cycle is now bringing new resources into the healthcare system to contribute to the well being of our staff and, and continued learning. And I think, again, um, another probably most important way to capture this learning community, these accountable care teams, is, is direct quotes from those who are now working on accountable care teams. And, and we'll have these slides available to you, but you see the real impact of how this has really equipped and empowered frontline clinicians to better communicate. This change is described, this new structure is described as phenomenal, helping them make the entire process work better for them and our patients. Uh, it's given new insight into what other disciplines do, or am I on the team? There's a forum where everyone's voice is equal. It's brought folks closer together in this feeling of a shared governance. It really is a transformational culture change, again, with structure and process that support continued learning. So that's just a little bit of context. We give you this menu of the various different units that are at various stages and becoming an accountable care team. Some like our renal transplant team have completed their entire initial onboarding process and are now functioning independently. Others such as bone marrow transplant or Tinsley Harrison are in the very early planning stages or just getting started. But throughout COVID, we've been able to continue rolling out this new support for our frontline teams and with support from our research community to help us better study this initiative. So again, appreciate your time, and I will turn it over to Dr. David McCollum, who is a hospital medicine physician. He also, he was our first accountable care team physician leader. He now works in the Department of Clinical Practice Transformation to support other folks becoming accountable care teams, and he will be the moderator for our panel today. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Kelly. That was a great introduction. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, just thinking, listening to Kelly, um, we're very excited to be here, very, uh, ex you know, excited to brag on ourselves a little bit and uh, really, you know, maybe become an optimal, maybe the preferred learning health system clinical partner. Um, we've, we're, you know, as Kelly has shown, we're fairly robust. Um, there's a lot of people involved, there's a lot going on, um, but there's tons of opportunity. Uh, on the research side. Um, there's obviously tons of opportunity on the clinical side too. That's going to happen. That is happening. Um, but yeah, so today we are just kind of going to, you know, further unpack what accountable care teams are. And we thought probably the best way to do that was really kind of do a deep dive into one of them. Um, so that's why we have our renal transplant group here, just because they're awesome and because we couldn't do, couldn't overview, you know, 20 of them. Um, so, um, and then we will spend a little time talking about research that has been done and, and you know, start thinking a little bit about what's possible. And obviously would love y'all's input on that. Um, yeah, so I might, I'll, maybe we'll just briefly introduce the panel. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll kind of go in order of, of how we're gonna do the questions, but yeah, I'm a hospitalist and then um, also a physician lead for one of the accountable care teams um, and listening, you know, talking to Dr. Meta, I think some of my experiences is very similar to hers, like fairly skeptical at first, more, more work, um, more meetings, you know, you're like, mm, I don't know about that. But then as you dive into it, you're like, what, how could we, how could we ever do without this? Um, okay, uh, let's see. So Amy, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Amy Stone, and I am um, the Accountable Care Team Program Coordinator. So I just kind of serve as air traffic control for all things Accountable Care Teams. Perfect. And Matt? 
Hello everyone, my name is Matthew Painter. I'm the Director of Leadership Development for UAB Medicine. Dr. Mehta. Hello everyone, I am Shika. I'm one of the transplant nephrologists. I take care of kidney transplant patients primarily. I'm also the medical director of the kidney transplant program and the physician lead on the accountable care team. And Raquel. Hello, uh, my name is Raquel Barks. I'm the nurse manager for the abdominal transplant unit, um, which is the unit where the kidney transplant patients come uh, before and after um, transplant. Dr. Meese. I am Catherine Meese. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Health Services Administration, and I serve as the director of wellness research for the UAB Medicine Office of Wellness. Okay, awesome. I also like how Zoom's putting these little uh, thumbtacks to keep us on top. Uh, I wondered how that was going to work, but that's cool. Okay, um, so we're going to start with uh, a little bit more briefly, a little bit how it, a little bit more how it works, then jump into renal transplant, and then jump into the research part. So, um, Amy, what's uh, what support is offered to accountable care teams at the outset? So at the outset of our accountable care teams, we really I try to engage with them early as soon as we know that an accountable care team will be coming online. Um, it's sort of like speaking a different language sometimes, even though we're very familiar with it. So I try to reach out to them early to just go over common language, the things that they'll need, the tools that you saw in the graphic that Dr. Flood showed about access to transparent data. We try to show them the dashboard and get them familiar with it so that it can be sort of seamless whenever they start their accountable care team. Um, I try to set a foundation for them to be successful as far as their meeting schedule, their times. It's a lot of people um, that come to these meetings. We try to make sure we have all the right people at the table before we get kicked off. So just um, compiling their rosters and scheduling their meetings, that's kind of what we do to get them set up for success at the outset. Perfect. Okay. And then my other question is, so what support is offered uh, long-term? So long-term, I try to serve as just a liaison between the teams. We try to get them set up early on with bi-directional communication between them and the, the oversight committees that we have for each of them. So for example, our hospital medicine teams have an oversight committee of uh, an accountable care team leadership team. And then we have kind of an implementation oversight group. And we try to make sure that throughout that, we're, we have a structured communication bi-directionally between the teams and leadership. So that's one way that we try to keep them successful throughout. And then I try to just build relationships with them throughout. I still attend many of the meetings, even once clinical practice transformation and LDO has, is not engaged with the teams anymore to just really kind of serve as that 30,000 foot overview so that I can share best practices amongst the teams. Many of the teams are dealing with the same issues. So I try to just serve as a connection between them so that I can share that learning between them. Okay, perfect. Okay, um, Matt, so we've heard, we've heard from Amy, uh, help, help us with the support that you and LDO offer the accountable care teams. Right. So I work in the leadership development office. We, we call it LDO for short. So our goal is to share our expertise in team dynamics, management, uh, organizational leadership, and uh, to couple our expertise with that of the triad. So we partner with the triad uh, to leverage each other's expertise because, um, as you all know, just because people work together doesn't automatically mean they're an effective team. And so our goal is to provide resources and tools to the triad in particular so that they can be successful in leading their, their triad um, to, towards accountable care teams. Um, one of the tools is DISC, as I'm sure many of you are uh, familiar with. We'll hear a little bit more, I think, about that in a moment. But um, all that to say is we provide a lot of tools in terms of helping lead and motivate and engage their microsystems um, towards this idea of accountable care. All right, perfect. Okay, so hopefully that helps uh, clarify some of the structure. Uh, there's obviously much more that could be said, but uh, we're going to shift over now and again talk to one accountable care team, which is renal transplant. So we'll start with uh, Raquel, the nurse manager of the renal transplant unit. 
um, and she's going to help us just with the context. Just a lot of these people are not in the hospital all the time, or maybe they are, but just help us with your unit. Who's there? Where? Who are the patients? Who are the providers? Who's? Where, where are they coming from? Where? Where are patients going? Okay. Um, so our provider teams. Um, it, mainly consist of uh, our attendings, our residents and fellows, uh, and also uh, advanced practice providers, nurse practitioners, uh, physicians assistants. Uh, and we also um, have the nursing uh, team that I manage that will include, you know, the staff nurse, my assistant nurse managers, uh, also uh, patient care technicians, unit secretaries, and then the larger team, um, you know, think about pharmacy, um, they're very involved in, in what we do and how we do things, case managers, social work. Uh, and we've actually, um, through the accountable care, um, you know, developed a stronger partnership with our physical therapy, uh, occupational ter therapy teams. Uh, so just speaking of the teams, that's kind of what the, the team consists of. And our patients, uh, the kidney transplant patients, they come to us preoperatively uh, before going to surgery. Uh, we prep them for surgery, they go to surgery, and they actually come back uh, to the floor. About 99% of those patients come straight back to the floor uh, into our step-down uh, room. And we manage them in a step-down setting for about 12, uh, upwards of 18 hours um, in the step-down setting before they actually move over to uh, the acute care uh, floor, a regular floor and bed, bed on the floor. So, um, Patients come to us um, from PACU, they come to us from home. Um, our patients actually also come to us from the clinic setting. They're uh, directly admitted uh, from the clinic if they're coming back in for readmission. Um, we also, um, you know, for our patients, they're either gonna be deceased uh, transplant patients or living uh, transplant patients. And we manage those patients primarily the same way after surgery. Um, but uh, their kidney function may present differently depending on the type of organ they've received. Um, so I think uh, just to kind of talk about, you know, who we are, what we do in our patient population. Um, that, okay. That, yeah. Now that sounds perfect. Um, so before we get in, so we kind of understand the, the service now, before we get actually into the accountable care team, I think it might be helpful to think about pre-accountable care team. So you got what sounds like a very complex thing going on. You got uh, patients, sick, very sick patients, complicated medicine coming from the OR, going to step down unit, going to the floor, leaving. I know a good number of them actually go to the hotel because um, they need to keep getting um, close observation. Maybe they need several more dialysis sessions. Um, anyways, so in the past, pre before the accountable care team, tell us about how you guys worked on complex issues or recurrent problems um, that I'm sure are, are part of the deal when you have such a complex unit. Exactly. Um, as you may know, I've been a part of transplant for many years. So I've had uh, you know, the opportunity to work on different or various um, process improvements with our transplant programs. Uh, and in the past, I think, um, you know, we've approached things, you know, kind of in like a silo where we may be working on things. We've always worked really well together. We've always been able to communicate effectively. Uh, but um, I think with the accountable care um, aspect of it, we've been able to come together in a more kind of formal, um, proactive way. Uh, we get things, we've gotten things done a lot more um, quickly, easier. We've had um, stakeholder buy-in, uh, buy-in from the different team members. And I think the biggest part is just having everybody um, to be a part of what we're doing and having a platform that's already established so that when we bring an issue or process to that team, the accountable care team, we had all the kind of um, tools that we needed in order to be effective uh, with our process improvements. Okay, awesome. Okay, thank you, Raquel. So um, shifting a little bit to Dr. Beto. Now, when Dr. Flood first approached you about being a, a physician lead for an accountable care team, what was going through your head? Good, David, very similar to your thinking. The first time Dr. Flood and the CTI leadership approached me to be part of the kidney transplant accountable care team, 
I was very skeptical. I was not looking forward to sending an email about early discharges to the providers. I was not looking forward to being the police uh, as to say to discharges. And I thought that's what the job entails. And none of us love that job, right? Mm -hmm. So um, then CTI leadership and accountable care team leadership, which was Dr. Flood actually, spoke to us about the goals of the accountable care team. And to me, it felt like the mission of ACT aligned very well the mission of our comprehensive transplant institute or the kidney transplant program. And I thought this was a good platform to deliver efficient yet effective and accountable care to our patients, especially the inpatients at that time. And you know, we could join hands together as disciplines to accomplish those goals and have a common room and share a common room and share that governance kind of a thing. At this time, both me and Raquel, we thought through this and we were more willing to embark on this journey and just to see what it is gonna be like for our patients. And I mean, there's more to come. Awesome. Okay, no, I think that's a great, great start. So yeah, with, with that background, uh, would would you guys just tell us a bit about your ACT journey? I can start and Raquel pitch in any time. So I would say that first step was leadership development through Matt, Matthew Painter's you know, program. And after that initial identification of the physician leader, which in again, kidney transplant, remember it's a surgical leader and a medical leader because our patients are um, both admitted under surgery care and medicine care at the same time. And a nursing leader and quality leader, we all went through a journey of leadership development. Now, all of us individually have gone through multiple leadership development programs and had this personalities assessed in different fashions. And uh, what the LDO did for us, instead of that personal growth and development, it was all about building a strong team to understand each other and how each other, how everybody works on the team and understand each other's personalities. And Raquel, I know you want to give a perfect example yeah. about that. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, I remember distinctly about, you know, how we, you know, kind of learn each, each other's um, disc. You know, we had some high Ds, high I, high S. Uh, and just kind of getting to know each other in that way and learning, you know, what our strengths were, you know, even knowing what our weaknesses were so that we would be able to support each other, you know, and build on those strengths and, and just kind of say, hey, you know, we know we need a D for this uh, project. So we would pull on that D. Well, we need, you know, that S person to step in. So we, we complimented each other. Uh, and the other thing that I just kind of want to add about LDO is that we got to know each other on a personal level. Um, we learned some, you know, personal things about each other. And I think that says a lot and it helps to allow us to work better together as a team and, and support each other uh, in our different process efforts. Okay, that's great. Thank you. All right, so moving along, um, we've heard a little about the beginning and about LDO. Um, Help us out. We've heard there's organized or organized problem solving. Help us. How, how does that work? I think Dr. McCollum's, uh, the, uh, the name that was given was clinical practice tra transformation to this process, which we went through for four to six weeks, I want to say. And what it did was it gave us various tools to handle problems in a very logical and a structured manner. And I want to quote something that Einstein once said, that we can solve problems with the same thinking that created them. So what CPT or you know, clinical practice transformation did is it gave us an opportunity with these tools, such as 3D problem solving tool is one of the example, where we, instead of reacting to a problem, approached it in a more logical fashion, where we discovered a problem, distilled it down, to the T and then define that problem and created an action plan based on that. And then actually saw the results and reacted again to the same you know, problem as it will come to us. So to me, various tools were given to us, but 3D problem solving tool was one of the most helpful tool, which we 
use in everyday teamwork. And I just to add about the 3D problem solving, uh, if you want to think about brainstorming, it's brainstorming on steroids. Um, we, um, you know, we worked through our different problems. Everybody had input. Uh, it was a team effort. And at the end of whatever we brought to the table, uh, it was a product that we all, you know, were proud of. So that, that was very helpful and that was a great tool. Uh, that we were able to utilize with brainstorming and problem solving. Okay, perfect. Okay, so we've got, we've got some good background. We understand uh, your your team. We understand your, some of your tools. Um, so let's try to, let's dive in a little bit and actually some of the outcomes or some of the activities. Um, you mentioned a length of stay pro project or, or Dr. Flood. Um, now, from my experience, I'm, I'm a, a hospitalist um, and decreasing length of stay is a an oft sought goal. I kind of think of it like kind of a holy grail project, like everybody wants it, but um, getting there and especially sustaining is, is uh, pretty remote, pretty, pretty rare. Um, and I see from your data, I've seen it before, you've actually decreased length of stay by a day, a CMI adjusted length of stay by a day, which is really tremendous. Um, and you've sustained it for a year, longer. Um, so I think we have a slide, Kelly, I don't know if we have that slide that has um, the different um, activities. Yeah. So uh, can you speak more about the ACT experience with uh, decreasing length of stay, how, how that worked out? So I can start and Raquel pitch in again. So I would say, you know, we all recognize that there's plenty of literature out there which suggests that, you know, reducing length of stay improves morbidity, mortality, reduces the burden on the caregiver, the patient. It's very, it's necessary for both mental and physical health of a patient. And in kidney transplant, we recognize that our length of stay needs to be reduced uh, for that reason, just to kind of improve that physical and mental health of the patient and the caregiver as well. So, you know, when I was approached about this, this was one of the first problems we took on and I didn't know where to start, honestly. And the CPT tool of kind of talking about the problem and actually discovering it that how do we, what is the actual problem? Like, where do we start? we distilled down the problem to these seven milestones. So we came up with that these are the seven milestones our patient, each one of our patients need to achieve to be able to have a successful outcome as an outpatient or to be successfully discharged from the hospital. And it truly took a village, you know, a village to kind of, we assigned each of these milestones to some disciplines within our team members. Um, and then individually worked on them while connected with each other every week to kind of see where we are on our individual milestone and try to brainstorm together if there are other ways to do it. And I, it took us a good six to eight months to kind of distill down each problem and develop an action plan. And there was a lot of help from quality data, you know, uh, side of things where they actually showed us that this is what it takes to remove a Foley. This is what it, you know, it means you're using so much opioids and, or you're not giving education, you're giving education, but could it be something that we could do early on? So there was a lot of help from data and analytics people. Um, and then uh, we kind of took each one of these pieces and connected the dots and implemented each of these milestones in a timely fashion once a patient gets a kidney transplant and we're gradually able to reduce the length of, this, length of stay. One of the big examples is early ambulation. It was Raquel's pet project. I mean, she was very passionate about it to begin with. Um, we had one of the surgical leaders also involved in this pet project who is no longer with ACT because of other reasons, but he um, was very passionate about early ambulation and opioid reduc reduction of opioid use. So Raquel, you want to speak a little more to it? Yeah. Yeah. And like uh, Dr. Mehta said, early ambulation was something that um, I knew uh, that we definitely could, you know, do something about. And 
I knew that um, getting patients up early was uh, highly linked to, you know, the pain management regimen that we were using. So in the beginning, all of our patients uh, were on PCA pumps when they arrived to the floor from PACU. So uh, trying to get to, you know, the early ambulation piece of things, uh, we knew that we needed to um, kind of remove that uh, and give our patients the opportunity to get up because the PCA pump was something that kind of kept them in bed. It, they were drowsy. They weren't, you know, feeling, you know, up to it. It just kind of slowed things down. So the opioid stewardship program helped us, you know, transition from PCA pumps. So we no longer uh, use PCA pumps on our patients, our kidney transplant patients coming from PACU. They're all receiving oral and um, IV uh, push um, pain regimen. And we're able now to get our patients up um, in that step down setting uh, by early the next morning. Uh, it took a lot of work, a lot of effort, you know, from, you know, everybody. Uh, it involved nursing, of course, the opioid stewardship um, uh, department. And it really, really uh, could not have been uh, done if we didn't have the partnership that we gained by working closer, closer with our PTOT uh, team, our therapy team. Um, so I just, you know, think that, you know, when you work together and you, you build a team and everybody's on, you know, have the same goals, you know, there's a lot that can be done uh, and accomplished and early ambulation, getting patients up um, early after transplant um, was a success on our part for our team. And David, I just want to add one little thing to this piece, uh, and I want to keep the time in my mind, but, uh, you know, pain management is not just something you can manage on the unit itself. It was something that we had to start from the OR, which you know is such a big task. So putting those lidocaine, you know, giving that sub Q injection in the OR, mm -hmm. bringing that patient out and putting a lidocaine patch in the PACQ unit, educating all the OR nurses, all the PACQ nurses, and then comes the nursing unit, you know, which was the abdominal transplant unit where we had to educate all the nurses to do that. It seems like a simple, it seems like a simple task, but it truly took a lot of people to make accomplish this. But again, I would reemphasize ACT gave us that platform where you were not individually going and in, working in silos with each of those teams. We work together in one place, one room to accomplish this. Okay, thank you guys so much. Um, I think the final kind of operational question I wanna hear from you guys. So you gave a great example of a, of a major project with you know, great sustain, you know, that sustained, it was a tremendous amount of work. Um, do you have any examples of the accountable care team like if emergent things pop up? or urgent things pop up on the unit. Do you have an example of the accountable care team being used for that? So there is actually a very good example of this within the last year, I would say. In the last year, there has been a surge of multi-drug resistant organisms. Infection, not only in our hospital, but even nationally, I've heard a lot about it. And unfortunately, our patients pay the cost of that, right? So I'm in kidney transplant patients and other transplant patients really suffer and have a huge mortality morb morbidity associated with these MDR or infections, which is the multi-drug resistant organism infection. And very quickly in the COVID era, we realized that our patients are being affected with it and more than usual, the incidence rate and the prevalence rate had gone up very high. Along with us, in parallel, our infection control team recognized it pretty quickly. Our nursing leaders recognized it pretty quickly. And we were all trying to figure out how to solve this problem. And we got approached from different places to see if there is a common platform where we can collect together and brainstorm some ideas to protect our patients from this infection. And there was, I mean, I brainstormed earlier on the outside of accountable care team. And I was like, what, this is a perfect setup to bring, or this is a perfect problem to bring to accountable care team. Okay. And then, so Raquel, Jill, who's on the call, if I'm not wrong, Dr. Jeremy Walker, I can't name the people who were involved in this, but infection control, transplant infectious disease, nursing leaders, 
um, all came together in one room to try and figure out how we can take some quick actions and then how we can do some long-term actions to figure out what the actual situation and the gravity of the problem is. And pretty soon some basic simple steps were taken, including swabbing surfaces, swabbing rooms, swabbing ORs, swabbing, swabbing cystoscopy suites where the patients go for their stent placements and removals, you know, uh, using strict contact precautions, um, educating providers, nursing, dietary people, environmental services. And there was a pro, uh, way of cleaning that started on our floor, which is called a halo seal cleaning, which is some intense form of cleaning for 12 hours to kind of remove all colonization of the bacteria. And just with these simple steps, we started seeing a shift in which we are not seeing as much resistant bacteria. Now, I don't have the data to prove that yet. Um, but long term, when you know, kind of thinking about this problem and the gravity of problem, other long term actions have been taken, whereas we're going to screen our kidney transplant patients for this infection when they come in for transplant. And so this is a perfect example where I feel like so many teams came together and um, took some simple actions which were needed and which were emergent, and then took some long, you know, some actions which will take more time to kind of understand the gravity of this problem. Yeah. Um, Raquel, what do you think? Well, to be honest, um, you know, it's kind of hard to imagine um, how this, you know, this problem would have been managed, you know, outside of having uh, the accountable care team platform. I think we would have eventually, you know, kind of addressed these things, but it would have definitely taken more time to get quick action. Um, and it, you know, definitely great to have this type of platform. Uh, and we were able to kind of, you know, pull together our team more quickly, you know, brainstorm, figure out what do we need to do, put in next steps, and also get the key uh, people involved early into the process. And one of the things that's come out of it, just from the unit level, uh, from the nursing uh, team, is that we've identified champions. You know, I have two nursing uh, champion leaders on the floor who are helping to make sure that we're sustaining our efforts, you know, on the, the unit from, you know, the nursing standpoint. And also the, you know, the, um, the kind of uh, collaboration that we have with infectious disease and the, the larger group. Uh, we do also uh, meet, you know, we have an MDR work group uh, that's kind of helping to make sure that we're staying on top of things uh, and communicating more effectively with um, what we're doing and what our next steps are. Okay, that sounds great. Okay. Um, very impressive work. Already for, I was already familiar with it, but I think everyone else is now also. Um, so as we transition to Dr. Meese, my final question for you guys, I mean, again, we've already talked about the healthcare worker fear of meetings. You know, it's going to keep you at work longer. It's going to keep you from the patients. Um, but it sounds like maybe this meeting's different. Um, and then also just with wellness and, and burnout and engagement, how, how has this meeting or this being a part of the accountable care team felt to you guys? Well, David, I, I would say I've been a faculty at UAB for 11 years, and I've seen multiple disciplines come together and work towards common goal. But ACT, which is accountable care team, for the, I personally feel for the first time has given everybody a very psychologically safe environment to come speak their hearts without being judged. People actually feel that they're being heard. They feel accountable. They want to champion programs, just like Raquel mentioned. They feel like their ideas are embra embraced and all of which gives a very rise to a very healthy environment to come, with, to come up with creative solutions. You know, things you never hear about, things you people think about, but feel nervous to talk about. So I've, ACT has given us that platform to come up with those solutions. And I'm really proud to be part of the team despite my initial hesitation. Awesome. And I'll just speak to just the idea of having more meetings. Um, you know, I think we, you know, with COVID, we went to Zooms and I think my meeting uh, count went up exponentially with, uh, with COVID and Zooms. And then the ACT, um, you know, we kind of got it started before COVID, but when COVID came, it just kind of helped to have that uh, platform. 
Uh, but I, I would like to say that, you know, more meetings, you know, can be stressful, uh, but we were able to work through that stress and get to a place where we could, you know, utilize our uh, ACT and be very effective with how we manage meetings. They don't always last, you know, an hour. You know, if, we, if we're done in 20 minutes, we're done, you know, uh, and I think that's the other piece, you know, you learn you know, in the LDO and, and CPT that, you know, you know, be, be effective. You know, the most important thing is how effective is your meeting, uh, not that you have to sit there for an hour. Uh, so those are some things we learned and uh, it's been a great journey. Uh, and I've just appreciated, you know, having a partnership, you know, with other members, the collaboration uh, through ACT and having Dr. Netta uh, as a physician lead on ACT. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, renal transplant. All right. Uh, so we're going to shift from with that in mind over to Dr. Meese. Um, Dr. Meese, tell us about your involvement as a researcher kind of embedded with these with these ACTs. Yeah, so I have the best job of all because I get to tell this amazing story without having to do all the hard work. So um, that's such a treat. But you know, my role is to uh, try to study in a rigorous way the effects of the accountable care team on its team members. And so I'm really looking at the well being of the healthcare worker um, across the organization and specifically on the ACT team. So I will say that organizational research is messy. You know, it's not a neat and tidy randomized controlled trial where I get to, you know, put you each right where I want you in the correct time. People leave, they change units, but it is unbelievably rewarding. Um, so as I look at healthcare well-being across um, the organization and, and I'm hearing stories nationally of what it's been like for healthcare workers over the past two years, um, you know, it makes you want to cry into a bucket of ice cream, right? It's, it's been a really tough two years. And sometimes I have to be the bearer of bad news, like don't shoot the messenger, but we're on the struggle bus. And I think getting to study the ACTs has been such a lifeline for me as a researcher to be able to say, but here's something that's working. And it's working in an amazing and statistically significant way to change people's experience at work. So to be able to, in a small sample size, show statistically significant improvements in decisional involvement, autonomy, teamness, um, resilience, uh, reduced loneliness at work, increased sense of belonging, all of these things that we're finding through our research I mean, that's just incredible to be a part of and to be party to. So I get the best job of, of everyone to get to tell that story through research. Awesome. Okay. And you may have covered this, but just do you have more to say about your wellness research on ACTs? Well, okay. So, so you've gathered that I love it. Um, <laughs> but I will say that, you know, we're trying to understand as an industry, this is nationwide, we're trying to understand as an industry, how do we keep people working in healthcare? How do we keep people working in our organizations amid the great resignation where we've lost over 500,000 healthcare workers over the past two years and many more considering leaving the profession. So when I see these elements of um, a healthy work culture being improved in a substantial way on the backdrop where in some other pockets of the organization, we're seeing a decrease. So that improvement becomes all the more remarkable it really gives me great hope for tools that we have that are effective, um, that are able to be implemented in our organizations that can help start to solve that problem. And we know that a toxic work culture is 10 times more likely to cause the attrition of an employee, and just, uh, regardless of industry, relative to things like compensation. And so to see these elements of a positive work culture um, taking root in our organization is, is really exciting. And so, um, I'm grateful for these teams' work to try to scale that and to get that to more teams so that people can have that same experience at work. Awesome. Okay. All right. So ha what have you learned about the benefits and opportunities for researchers, such as yourself, to partner with front frontline clinicians and, and other operation staff? Yeah, so I think there's been tremendous positives, um, and I'm learning still. You know, I'm relatively new to this. But the enjoyment for me is to get to see uh, the real work happening and to also get to see that rapid cycle of the data that we collect for research um, being put into practice and being used to make adjustments. So we try to be really, really thoughtful about the way that we collect survey data, whether it's for the ACTs or for our employee-wide poll survey, that we're doing it in such a way that can both support research that hopefully doesn't burden our healthcare workers too much in terms of um, length and design, but then also can be rapidly uh, reintroduced to the organization for decision-making. 
So when we use large external vendors, for example, for a survey every couple of years, we can't access our own data. We can't do rigorous analysis on it. We sort of get this you know, shelved report. And so we miss a lot of the timely nuance of the story that our leaders need to be able to adjust and respond effectively. And so I think getting to see that happen more quickly as a researcher is really gratifying. Um, it helps me get through the 99th revise and resubmit, you know, for my article that's going to come out five years from now. So um, to get to see those faster results of that research has been just tremendously exciting as, as a researcher. So I wouldn't trade it. Awesome. Okay. And again, you may have touched on this already, but any, anything else you want to say about the value as a research that you are uh, contributing something meaningful in addition to the publishing? Yeah, so I think getting to see slow, you know, organizational change is always going to be slow. It doesn't matter where you are, but getting to see some slow and positive changes um, that are, are somewhat supported by the work that we're doing. I can't take credit for these big changes, but that we're starting to see more investment in childcare. We're starting to see more attention to wellness. We're starting to see a difference in the way that people talk about resilience and well-being and, and the role of organizational stressors. You know, getting to see that movement is really satisfying and exciting. Um, I think it's a incumbent upon us in academia to really tell our story better in terms of what we can contribute and how we can partner in these types of projects. So the earlier we can get involved, um, the more strategic we can be about trying to measure things and tell the story in a way that serves many different purposes from organizational decision making to scholarship. Awesome. Okay. Dr. Mehta, listening to you and then listening to Dr. Meese. Uh, imagine you had a collaborating research like Dr. Meese, um, working along the accountable care teams. Are, are there questions arising out of the accountable care teams that you think would benefit from further investigation? David, that's a great question. Uh, you know, I feel like a lot of time our clinician researchers, we can come up with projects and research ideas, but are very less familiar with the rigorous study designs and analysis and also lack the bandwidth right now or the time to kind of lead all aspects of a study. So collaborating with somebody like Dr. Mies would be wonderful because all these ideas keep popping in our head that we made all these changes, but how is it truly affecting the quality or quantity or the cost effectiveness for all the changes. Simple example, length of stay, right? We partnered with opioid stewardship team to reduce uh, the use of PCA pump, but how does it affect and how does it change opioid addiction going forward for those kidney transplant patients could be a big question. Raquel applied for a grant for early mobility what is mobilizing a person at six hours versus early on, we used to do it after 24 hours, mean for that patient and, you know, sarcopenia and recovery of muscles kind of a thing. Um, same with recovery of bowel function, has it reduced the, I mean, there are ideas after ideas which we can generate just from a simple example of the seven milestones we chose for reducing the length of stay. And I would love, and our team would love to partner with somebody like Dr. Mies, who can give us the insight into that detailed analysis that needs to go to be able to publish something like that so that other patients, other centers can benefit from it. Perfect, perfect. Okay, um, so my final question uh, before I pass it back to um, Dr. Hall um, is for, is kind of the other side of that for Dr. Meese. So what, what are your thoughts um, in terms of opportunity for researchers to work with ACTs and what, what should we all be considering as we become, you know, as we go down this learning health system journey? Yeah, you know, I think the greatest opportunity is to try to get a research partner involved early in the process, as early as possible. Um, you know, sometimes just the way that organizations move and the pace that academia moves, things are already down the road before we get involved and we're trying to sort of scrape it together to study it after the fact. And so I think the more that we can have that true partnership where we can say, hey, what if we made this small tweak, it would make a huge difference in terms of our ability to tell the story um, is really helpful. And I think there are so many willing partners who would love to jump in there, but they're not quite sure how to get started. So. I think there are a lot of opportunities for us as an organization, a broader organization, um, to create a conduit and a pipeline so that people aren't you know, digging through trying to find some individual researcher to help, but that we have a mechanism in place to make these connections um, so that we can tell that story 
and and share the good things that are happening here out into the world and not just improving care locally but but globally awesome thank you everyone um and let me i think that's a great place for dr hall to pick up oh you're muted dr hall Sorry about that. I have a new a new computer, so I'm trying to figure that out. But thank you very much, Catherine, for sort of queuing us up with uh, what I wanted to spend the last couple of minutes for today talking about. So um, you've heard a little bit about ACTs, and undoubtedly you've heard of other improvement projects that are going on in your health system. You may have an idea that's forming in your mind, and you need some support to flesh that idea out a little bit more. Or if you're a researcher, you might be looking for clinical partners. Uh, and so with uh, support from HSF uh, using the General Endowment Fund monies, uh, the Center for Outcomes, Effectiveness, Research and Education is launching uh, the UAB Learning Health System platform. And hopefully you can see this on my slide. And the way we envision this platform is it will be sort of a meeting place for uh, clinical operations folks or researchers to perhaps come together uh, to think about um, delving into ideas, obtaining data, uh, conducting analyses, what are the right kinds of appropriate designs, and then maybe perhaps even some support for writing and dissemination of your ideas or your future work. So the Learning Health System platform is open to anybody with a good idea, a good question, even a domain of interest. Uh, we will uh, provide you with some scientific feedback, uh, helping you uh, think a little bit about how to make your project into an analyzable question, a research question, an evaluation question. We will help you think about how you might obtain data, the kinds of data that you might need, uh, how that data might be best organized to help you uh, do the analysis that you want to do. And then if you are interested, some help again with writing and dissemination. You see this sort of picture here in this Learning Health System platform. And the main way through which people can get involved or, be, or find uh, research uh, collaborators or clinical collaborators is going to something that we call the scientific gateway. And I'll sort of show you how you can get to that. Uh, it's housed on our Center for Outcomes, Effectiveness, Research and Education website. It is a form that you can complete and it gives us some, uh, some insight into what you're thinking about so that we can help prepare you for a meeting or an incubator where we'll talk a little bit more about your project. If you need data, uh, if you need help accessing data, manipulating that data, we would then send you on to a gateway meeting where there'd be a much more intensive discussion about data. Uh, and then again, if you need help or support in writing a dissemination, we can sort of support you with that as well. As you can see on the little circles here, we will help you think through data transformation kinds of issues, data extraction kinds of issues, how you might operationalize your project with respect to research, uh, how you might uh, do the analyses of that, um, and a whole host of other things. So if you're potentially interested in engaging in, with UAB's health system, learning health system platform, we invite you to sort of Google UAB's learning health system, and that will take you to the Center for Outcomes Effectiveness Research and Education website. Uh, there will be a little tab that sort of says learning health system, and under that tab, you'll see something called the learning health system platform. That platform will take you to an interactive questionnaire where you can uh, tell us a little bit more about the kind of work that you want to do uh, and the kind of support that you perhaps need from the platform. And we will get back in touch with you. Uh, and so we are looking forward to engaging with folks in the health system and um, the health system folks. We're hoping that you come uh, uh, to us. Um, we, are, as Catherine sort of said, I think there are a lot of benefits to engaging um, first, it, we can make sure that we're asking the right relevant questions that are most important to you all. Um, and we can also help you sort of think about how to disseminate your ideas and disseminate your most important and impactful uh, learnings. And with that, uh, I will sort of stop here. I know it's one o'clock, but we can see if there are any uh, quick questions or um, feedback that anybody has uh, for us at this time.
So I want to uh, thank our uh, panel discussion, our panelists, a uh, very insightful learning health system is already happening here at UAB. I think the accountable care teams are one example of that. So you saw the learnings and then you saw the dissemination uh, piece. Uh, and so um, onward, as we like to say at the core, and we stand ready to uh, listen and hear from you about some of the things that you are involved in. All right, thank you all very much and stay tuned for next week, Tuesday. We have another speaker, Jeremiah Brown, who will be talking about some of his work in kidney injury um, and what he's been doing at Dartmouth uh, with respect to uh, learnings and the application of his learnings uh, within his institution. So thanks again and have a great rest of your day. <laughs>